this is Kay. And I've been doing a lot of dino research, dinosaurs, and I run across some super interesting literature. At least I thought it was interesting. So I wanted to share that with you. Most of the dinosaur, the beginnings of it, seem to all start in England. And the largest two publications that house all the papers on the early dinosaur studies are one, the Transactions of the Geological Society of London, and two, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. And it's those two publications where most of the dino info is located of the early dinosaur finds like ichthyosaur and plesiosaur and um, pterodactyls. Another dino find, and because it's a walking one now, the rest were sea creatures. Well, and there's the pterodactyl, and that's the air creature, I guess. The megalosaurus, because they wanted all big creatures, you know, the bigger the better. In fact, there were shows that went from country to country, depending city to city, of giant recreations of mastodons and other giant animals, the bigger the better. And they would fill in the fossils, you know, fill in the, so if they find like one or two fossils or a partial, they would complete the rest with their imagination. You can even see like early um, mastodons, how weird they looked when they just guessed at what the, the skeletons should look like compared to today. That's like back in the 1800s. So of course, they carried the same thing on with um, dinosaurs. So one of the early ones, also before 1824, was the Megalosaurus. Sometime around 1815, several bones were discovered in Stonesfield Quarry, north of Oxford. They were acquired by the professor of geology at Oxford University, William Buckland. He did not know what the bones belonged to until 1818. That's when George Cuvier visited Buckland in Oxford, where he concluded that the bones must belong to a giant lizard-like creature. Well, obviously, you find a jawbone with one tooth sticking out in a field, it has to be a giant-like creature lizard thing. I'm being sarcastic. The findings were described in 1822 by James Parkinson, and then in 1824, Buckland published his findings. The species named Bucklandi was named by George Cuvier after William Buckland, and is currently the only known valid species. So, I mean, that's ridiculous. You find just a, a in fact, it's not an entire jawbone. It's one quarter of a jawbone, one quarter. So it's the bottom jaw but half of that, not only the whole half, the front half. So it's actually one eighth of a jawbone, if you want to think about it, one eighth. And from one eighth of a jawbone found in a quarry, Cuvier, and he's one of the biggies here, the early dino find, he, dis he declares the bones must belong to a giant lizard-like creature. They must. <laughs> I'm going to be reading to you from today is the Philosophical Journal of the Royal Society of London. No, it's called the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. Okay. Let's read a little bit about that publication and how it got started. In 1662, the newly formed Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge was granted a charter to pub publish by King Charles II, and on the 6th March 1665, the first issue of Philosophical, Philosophical Transactions was published under the visionary editor editorship of Henry Oldenburg, who was also the secretary of the society. The first volumes of what was the world's first scientific journal were very different from today's journals. Blah, 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 blah. But it followed the same functions, namely to inform the fellows of the society and other interested readers of the latest scientific discoveries. As such, philosophical transactions established the important principles of scientific priority and peer review, which have become the central foundations of scientific journals ever since. 
In 1886, the breadth and scope of scientific discovery had increased to such an extent that it became necessary to divide the journal into two, Philosophical Transactions A and B, conveying the physical science and the life sciences, respectively. And there you have it. <laughs> playing is also from the same time period, the 1500s. So when these guys were writing these papers, they might have been listening to the following music I'm playing. All right. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start with just volume one of the transactions and just see how these guys are thinking, see how early scientists uh, started, what was their thinking in their earliest publications. And I ran across some, I thought they were pretty fascinating articles. And the clearly, we've got a lot of smart people here submitting articles to this publication. Well, let's do a little bit of reading from ter the Transactions of the Royal Society of London. <music> these great books seem to start with a prayer. I'll read you some prayers. Uh, it will not become me to add any attributes to a title which has a fullness of luster from his majesty's denomination. In the rude collections, which are only the gleanings of my private diversions and broken hours, it may appear that many minds and hands are in many places industriously employed under your continence and by your example, in the pursuit of those excellent ends which belongs to your heroic undertakings. All right, I'm skipping down the prayer. It's a little long. This is my solitude, that as I ought not to be unfaithful to those counsels you have committed to my trust, so also that I may not altogether waste any minutes of the leisure you afford me. And thus I have made the best use of some of them that I could devise, to spread abroad encouragements, inquiries, directions, and patterns that may animate and draw on universal assistances. The great God prosper you in the noble engagement of dispersing the true luster of his glorious works and the happy interventions of obliging men all over the world to the general benefit of mankind so wishes with real affections your humble and obedient servant, Henry Odenberg. a prayer right there, but there's also an introduction that we're going to read. Whereas there is nothing more necessary for promoting the improvement of philosophical matters than the communicating to such, as apply their studies and endeavors that way, such things are discovered or put in practice by others. It is therefore thought fit to employ the press as the most proper way to gratify those whose engagements in such studies and delight in the advancement of learning and profitable discoveries doth entitle them to the knowledge of what this kingdom or other parts of the world do from time to time afford, as well as the progress of the studies, labors, and attempts of the curious and learned in things of this kind, as their complete discoveries and performances, to the end that such productions being clearly and truly communicated desires after solid and useful knowledge may be further entertained, ingenious endeavors and undertakings cherished, and those addicted to and conversant in such matters may be invited and encouraged to search, try, and find out new things, impart their knowledge to one another, 
and contribute what they can to the grand design of improving natural knowledge and perfecting all philosophical arts and sciences. All for the glory of God and the honor and advantage of these kingdoms and the universal good of mankind. So now let's get to reading some of the article titles. See if we find a title, we'd like to read the whole article. All right, the first title, well, let me back up. We have a periodical or the, this publication and learned men throughout the world submit their articles to the publication, which will choose to or to not publish them. All right. So clearly everything in this book, King George has approved of. First article is an account of the improvement of optic glasses. There came lately from Paris a relation concerning the improvement of optic glasses, not long since attempted at Rome by Signor Giuseppe Campani and by him discoursed of in a book entitled Raguaglio de Nuovo Osservazioni, lately printed in the said city, but not yet transmitted into these parts, wherein these following particulars, according to the intelligence, which was sent hither, are contained. Yeah, they, I love uh, how technical and smart these guys are, and clearly they're trying to one-up the other scientists by scooping this knowledge. The first regardeth the excellency of the long telescopes made by the said company, who pretends to have found a way to work optic glasses with a turn tool without any mold, and whereas hitherto it hath been found experiments that small glasses are in proportion better to see with upon the earth than the great ones. The author affirms that his are equally good from the earth for making observations in the heavens. Besides, he useth three eye glasses for, this, for his great telescopes, without finding any iris or such rainbow colors as do usually appear in ordinary glasses and prove an impediment in observations. The second concerns the circles of Saturn in which he hath observed nothing but what confirms Monsignor Christian Hugen de Zulicum, his system of that planet published by the worthy gentleman in the year 1659. The third, I'm going to stop here. This is kind of hard to read because all the S's look like F's. So if you see me starting on a word, I'm trying to figure out it's, if it's an F or an S. Let's see. The third respects Jupiter, where a company affirms he hath observed by goodness of his glasses certain protuberances and inequalities, much greater than those that have been seen therein hitherto. He added that he is now observing whether those fallies, oh, sallies, fallies, in the said planet do not change their f s situation, which if they should be found to do, he judges that Jupiter might be said to turn upon his axe, which he, in his opinion, would serve much to confirm the opinion of Copernicus. Besides this, he affirms he hath marked in the belts of Jupiter the shadows of his satellites and followed them at length, seeing them emerge out of this disk. Well, that's kind of... So what are they talking about here? They're talking about Christian Hugens. Wow, so we're right in the middle of these guys observing all the planets in the solar system. That's pretty cool. All right, the next article is entitled, A Spot in One of the Belts of Jupiter. 
The ingenious Mr. Hook did some months finance intimate... Oh, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's again, Fs and Ss. The ingenious Mr. Hook did some months since intimate to a friend of his that he had, with an excellent 12-foot telescope, observed some days before that he spoke of it. This uh, His observation was May 1664, about 9 o'clock at night. A small spot in the biggest of the three obscurer belts of Jupiter, and that observing it from time to time, he found that within an hour after the said spot had moved from east to west, about half the length of the diameter of Jupiter. Next article is an experiment, an experimental history of cold. Wow, this is quite a technical one. Also, they do a bunch of experiments for, with uh, different items, and then they they didn't say what items. They just said bodies. They didn't say what bodies they were experimenting on. I want to read you just a couple of these experiments. One. So this whole article is about a guy who did all these different experiments. And then talks about it. So here's the, some of the experiments they were doing at the time in 1665. One, experimental touching bodies capable of freezing others. Two, experiments and observations touching bodies disposed to be frozen. Three, experiments touching bodies indisposed to be frozen. Four, experiments and observations touching degrees of cold in several bodies. Five, experiments touching the tendency of cold upwards or downwards. Six, experiments and observations touching the preservation and destruction of bodies by cold. Oh, here you go. They give us now what they mean by bodies. Eggs, apples, and other. So they're freezing eggs and not freezing eggs, freezing apples and not freezing apples, and putting them near each other and not each other. And see how that cold transfers. Experiments in consort touching the bubbles from which the levity of ice is supported to proceed. Experiments touching the expansive force of freezing water. Experiments touching the new way of estimating the expansive force of congelation and of highly compressing air without engines. So there's, <laughs> they're curious. They want to know what's our world about. Let's read the summary of this experiment. This treatise will be dispatched within a very short time and would have been so ere this if the extremity of the late frost had not stopped the press. It will be accompanied with some discourse of the fame author concerning the new thermometrical experiments and thoughts as also with the exercitation about the doctrine of the enterostatus in the former, whereas the first proffered this paradox, that not only our senses, but common weather glasses may misinform us about cold. Next, there are glasses, let's see, next there are contained in this part new observations about the deficiencies of weather glasses together with some considerations touching new or hermetrical thermometers. Lastly, they deliver another paradox, touching the cause of the condensation of the air and accent the water by cold in common weather glasses. The latter piece of this part contains an examine, an anti status, as it won't be taught and proved of all which there will perhaps a fuller account given by the next. Now that's 
next article is called An Account of a Very Odd Monstrous Calf. By the same noble person was lately communicated to the Royal Society an account of a very odd monstrous birth produced at Lymington in Hampshire, where a butcher having caused a cow, which her calf the year before, to be covered that she might the sooner be fatted, killed her when fat, and opening the womb, which he found heavy to admiration, saw in it a calf. All right, so we got a cow. He's going to eat the cow. It's a female, so he kills the cow and opens it up, and there's a calf inside, which had begun to have hair, whose hinder legs had no joints, whose tongue was cerebrus-like, triple, to each side of his mouth, one and one in the midst, between, all right, between the four legs and the hinder legs was a great stone on which the calf rid. The sternum, or that part of the breast where the ribs lie, was also perfect stone. And the stone on which it rid weighed 20 pounds and a half, and outside the stone was a greenish color. But some small parts being broken off, it appeared a perfect free stone. The stone, according to the letter of Mr. David Thomas, who sent this account to Mr. Boyle, is with Dr. Hotties of Salisbury, whom he also referreth for further information. The next article of an Hungarian bolus of the same effect with bolus arminus. I think they're talking about, I think it's clay because the they get clay from Hungary, from Armenia, but now they found a better clay to make stuff out of. Here's another article of a peculiar lead ore of Germany and the use thereof. There was, not long since, sent hither out of Germany from an inquisitive physician a list of several minerals and earths of that country, and of Hungary together with specimens of each of them, among which there were a kind of lead ore which is more considerable than all the rest because of its singular use in essays upon the copal. Feeling that there is not any metal mixed with it. It is found in the upper palatinate at a place called Freyung, and there are two forts of it, whereof one is a kind of crystalline stone and almost all good lead, and the other not so rich and more farinaceous. By the information coming along with it, there are Fetch, not from underground, but the mines of that place have lain long neglected by reason of the wars of Germany and the increase of waters and the people living there, and had lain long in the open air. The use above mentioned being considerable, that person who sent it hath been entreated to inform what quantities may he had of it, and there should be occasion to send some, send for some. titles are marked of the new American whale fishing about Bermuda. I'm just going to read a little bit. Let's see, maybe just the summary. Just good to see what these dudes are thinking. Here follows a relation somewhat more divertising than the precedent 
accounts which is about the new whale fishing in the West Indies about the Bermuda. As it was delivered by an understanding and hardy seaman who affirmed he had been at the killing himself, his account, as far as remembered, was this that, though thereto all attempts of mastering the whales of those seas had been unsuccessful by reason of the extraordinary fierceness and swiftness of these monstrous animals, yet the enterprise being lately renewed, and such persons chosen and sent thither for the work, were also resolved not to be baffled by the sea monster, they did prosper so far in this undertaking, that having been out at sea, near the said Isle of Bermuda, seventeen times, and fastened their weapons a dozen times, they killed in these expeditions two old female whales and three cubs, whereof one of those old ones from the head to the extremity of the tail was 88 foot in length by measures, its tail being 23 feet broad and its swing fin 26 feet long and the gills 3 feet long, having great bends underneath them, the nose to the navel upon her after parts, and then just they, they go on to talk about who they killed and what they yielded and what they can eat and what they can sell and use in industry. What replaces hogs. Interesting. They also tell you when to hunt whales off Bermuda from March to May, beginning of March to the end of May. So don't waste your time going any other time in trying to hunt whales any other seasons. <laughs> Next article, a narrative concerning the success of pendulum watches at sea for longitudes. Next article, the character lately published Beyond the Seas of an eminent person not long since dead at Thuluf, where he was a counselor at Parliament. It is the defervently famous Monsignor de Fermat, who was Faith, the author of the letter, one of the most excellent men of this age, a genius so universal and of so vast an extent that if very knowing and learned men had not given testimony of his extraordinary merit, what with truth can be said of him would hardly be believed. He entertained the, con the constant correspondence with many of the most illustrious mathematicians of Europe and did excel in all parts of mathematical science. So who is this uh, Monsignor de Fermat? It's the famous Pierre de Fermat. He was given credit for early development that led to calculus. Pretty smart dude. Fermat, look at that. He's talking about his death. And if I go to the wiki article for Pierre de Fermat, it says he was uh, born 1601, died 1665, right in time for this publication. What were his fields? Mathematics and law. He, um, we still use his math, Fermat's theorem. Of course, Fermat pronounced uh, in French, but written F-E-R-M-A-T. And this gentleman was quite an accomplished man in many areas, not just math and science. He, he talked about other treaties. All these mathematical works and all these curious searches in antiquity did not hinder this great virtuoso from discharging the duties of his place with much, much assurance and with so much ability that he hath the reputation of one of the greatest civilians of his age. 
But that which is most of all surprising to many is that with all the strength and undertaking which was requisite to make good these rare qualities, lately mentioned he had so polite and delicate parts that he composed Latin, French, and Spanish verses with the same elegancy as if he had lived in the time Augustus and passed the greatest part of his life at the courts of Francis and Spain. More particulars will be perhaps be mentioned with the works of this rare person when all things he hath published shall be recovered and when liberty shall be obtained of his worthy son to impart into the world the rest of his writings is thereto unpublished. Silkworms. One is about silkworms. What are they trying to do with it? Silkworm communicated that. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. All right. That's important. They're making silk. So that was an industry article or silkworms. Another article on account of micrographia or the physiological description of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses. Oh, I wonder if they're finding any viruses. The attentive reader of this book will find that there being hardly anything so small as by the help of microscopes to escape our inquiry, new visible world a new visible world is discovered by this means, and the earth shews quite a new thing to us, so that in every little particle of its matter we may now behold almost as great a variety of creatures as we were able to before to reckon upon in the whole universe itself. Here our author maketh it not improbable, but that by these helps the susceptibility of the composition of bodies and the structure of their parts, the various textures of their matter and the instruments and manner of their inward motion and all the other appearances of things may be more fully discovered, whence may emerge many admirable advantages towards enlargement of the active and mechanic parts of knowledge, because we may perhaps be enabled to discern the secret workings of nature. <laughs> that seems to be the whole reason. The secret workings of nature, and we're still at it today. And then the article goes on to talk about what they looked at in the microscope. They looked at the edges of razors. Why are they so sharp? Fiery sparks. Um, they looked at colors. They looked at sand, gravel, and urine gravel and urine, oh, diamonds and flints, frozen figures, kettering stone, charcoal, wood, petrified bodies, pores of cork. What's in that cork pore? Get the microscope. Other substances, vegetables growing on blighted leaves, blue mold, sponges, fibrous bodies, seaweed, oh, leaves, stinging points of a nettle, wild oats, the feed of corn violet, as also of thyme, poppy, purslane, wings and head of a fly, teeth of a snail. <laughs> That's tiny. You definitely need a microscope for that. Eggs of a silkworm and the blue fly, water insects, tufted gnats, white moth, shepherd spider, ants, wandering mites, crab-like insect. It's probably crabs in your crotches, right? They're like, what's this thing down here itching me? Fleas, louse, mites, and fine mites. He concludeth with taking occasion to discourse of the two or three very considerable subjects v. the inflection of the rays of lights in the air. Mm. Sounds like they're pretty excited to be able to finally see these tiny, tiny things. Get on in those little tiny holes. See what's in there. On the 
about uh, a tenth of the way through, and I think we can call it good. My point was to sample this publication so that we could see what these early explorers and thinkers were trying to uncover. But it also has to be mentioned that the almighty state is in all of these documents. The almighty state, King George, this publication is meant to make King George happy. Some things will be in it and some things won't. good idea of how these guys were thinking at the time. One, they wanted to know what their universe was, what their world was made of, but two, they also wanted to gain advantage. I guess my point is the pursuit of knowledge was not selfless always. I mean, yeah, they wanted to know, but if they could make money off it, yeah, y'all. Thank you so much for joining me today for selected readings from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London, Volume 1. 1665.